I'm calling time. Not time out. Time in. It's time to go. <laughs> All right. So, pull out your hymnal. Number 358. I am thine, O Lord. We're going to do one, two, and four. 358. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith, and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with Thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Now, they were talking about the happy fall coming and all like that. Sinus pun is not happy. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> now, Miss Jan, we were talking earlier about songs that have a different background to them. It's the same words and something different. We did that Wednesday night. And I chose this because I'm going to sing one verse of it in a different way for you so you would hear it. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told of thy great love for me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith, and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Brother Jesse. Calvin, I am not going to impose on you, but tonight's message be a little bit shorter, more devotional style, just because. Um, still, we still within the camera, though. I don't want to get too far. <laughs> Anybody? We still okay? Okay. Um, now we can work on taking out the back. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you guys hold on to the back pews. God's got a good work, and you're going to fill them up. You're going to fill them up. Um, so. Um, but I, I, again, I hate like to just throw this on you, but this morning, 
uh, I was reading uh, an old hymn from uh, that back many years ago when I went through the book of Ruth uh, at the church in Northern Virginia was a song that I had attached to this passage. And I don't know if we could sing it um, as maybe as a closing prayer for us, but uh, it's in the hymn book. It's number 76, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. But we'll do that at the end, just as, a, as our prayer of benediction and blessing to go forth, if, we, if you're able to do that. Oh, okay, great. Um, so we're going to pick up in Ruth uh, chapter 2, and uh, we'll, we'll just move in, basically um, starting where we kind of left off. We'll, we'll, we'll pick up, I think we'll start with verse 8, because that's sort of the natural progression there. And uh, we're going to read on down through most of the chapter. And again, uh, we could probably come back and just, and just unpack a lot more. But I, I really want to just sort of give you some devotional thoughts that I hope are just very practical expressions of, uh, of grace um, in this. I do want to make a comment before we get started. Um, uh, I got this book we, we, at our event yesterday. We tried to give away. We had about six different books out for people based upon how, what their needs might be. Um, we had a, a couple that dealt with the loss of a child, or written by those who had lost a child. We had some written by uh, people who've already gone to be with the Lord, but just good resources. And uh, one of those is a, a book that I would encourage and um, you to read, but it's also a great resource if in the midst of someone going through grief as a real ministry um, to, to be able to hand them. It's a small book and really... It's called When Pain is Real and God Seems Silent, because we've all, we've all experienced that. And it, and it doesn't just deal with grief in the sense of, of, um, uh, of, of say, uh, the passing of someone, someone who's gone through a divorce. This could be very helpful. Someone's just going in the midst of difficult moments, and you know, they're, they're reaching out to the Lord, and they're not, they just don't feel like they're hearing anything back. Ligon Duncan, who's uh, a pastor um, in Mississippi, uh, took two psalms and just sort of unpacked those. And it's a great, great little resource or reference to have. So I highly recommend it um, for your encouragement. Um, all right, picking up now. Ruth chapter 2. Let's again begin in verse back in verse 8. And let's pray first and then we'll, we'll move in. Father, your kindness to us. And your mercy to us, um, it, is, it is new each morning, and it is good throughout each day. Lord, um, for the time of worship and, and celebration and grace for which we felt and experienced this morning, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy. It was a sweet time to be with uh, my sweet brothers and sisters, and I'm very grateful. Thankful that we're here tonight, that we can gather together, we can encourage one another and be encouraged in your word. Pray that you would bless this time, that you would, you would use it uh, for edification, for nurturing of our souls. I thank you for this afternoon, for myself, my confession, uh, for just a restful afternoon um, and the blessing of a nap. I'm thankful, God, for all that you have laid before us this week and pray that you would just, um, just that this week you would open doors for us to be able to to, to minister and to engage people with gospel, with good news. And I pray this, Lord Jesus, in your name, for your glory. Amen. Hey, so, <clears throat> um, may I ask you to be praying, especially tomorrow for, for me, in two things. Um, if you would re re remember, the Lord brings to your mind. So, um, one of the specific trainings I have done in counseling is a method that we call Trauma Resilience Protocol, or TRP for short. And um, it's a very powerful tool um, that is incredible for those who are actively in post-traumatic stress, who would actually qualify as in post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's, there's some specifics. I mean, all of us have gone through trauma, but... You know, I myself, I don't live and have never lived in the dynamic of what I'd call PTSD, active PTSD. But anyway, through the training, through the organization, um, they make it available to any, any um, 
military personnel, active or, reti or, or retired, removed, um, any first responder at no charge. So it's about a, it's about a two hour long procedure you do with someone that's in, again incredibly helpful. It's seen some tremendous results. Um, uh, I extended that through our organization, not only to do it at no charge for those groups, but also to do it for pastors um, or their families. And so, um, in my in the partnership that our organization has with a church up in Gadsden, Alabama, I have been ministering to a, 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 a retired minister of music's wife, and he's part time at at a church, and uh, and. Um, just a lot of, you know, just kind of difficulties of things. And so the last two weeks ago, she came in. And to be quite honest with you, she's in her mid-60s. Um, there uh, had been a lot of stuff that the brain from childhood had repressed. And, and that came up and out. Um, and, and it came out in such a way that as she explained what happened, it was quite obvious that 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 there is that you would define it by way of PTSD, and um, and she was too embarrassed to talk about it, um, and so you know been doing this long enough to understand probably you know what that meant, what did that looked like. Now she'll need some ongoing counseling, that's for sure, probably from a female therapist to to unpack some things. And I'm grateful this church actually their their children's minister has a degree in counseling and is really good with with trauma that deals in probably the nature of what she needs. And so they've made that individual a resource for for this lady going forward. But uh, tomorrow, beginning at ten o'clock, we'll we'll begin this. We'll we'll do this with her. And um, and so if you'd be praying, if you think if it comes to mind, pray for for her because um, it, it she has lived unfortunately in in the bondage of this brokenness, which is something that was done to her, and uh, it um, it has affected her in a lot of relationships. And to be quite honest, um, she she literally thought the next stage of her life would have, would would be living in a mental hospital. And I, and I believe, I don't believe that's going to be the case. I believe God's going to work through this process and, and there's going to be good. So if you think about that, that'll be from 10 to 12, 1230 tomorrow. And then, I don't even know how, but through a series of events and recommendations, a, a lady is coming to see me tomorrow, a young lady. And uh, her mom said, now to be very honest with you, she, she's not a Christian and she doesn't like Christians. And she especially doesn't like pastors. I thought, well... <laughs> So, but she's coming to see me, and so if she went to our website to look about me, and she's not a pastor for 20 plus years, and so, but she's coming in, and uh, and I pray that God will just start opening the doors where the gospel, the good news could be sown into her life, and uh, so we'll no, don't force anything, but I do pray that God would would begin to to work graciously. So, so it's it's going to be a full day in that regard, and if you think about praying for me in those, I would greatly appreciate it. Ruth chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You listen now, daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then Ruth fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. Yahweh repay your work and a full reward be given you by Yahweh Elohim. Remember, that, that, that when those words are woven together, those two titles of God, it means our personal, intimate God, Yahweh, who is the covenant giver to the nation of Israel. I am your God. I alone am your God. I, and then God here 
is the word Elohim, and it intends to imply to us he is the creator. And so if you think about it, Yahweh created the nation of Israel, right? And so when he does that, it's this double emphasis. May Yahweh repay your work. A full reward be given you by Yahweh Elohim, um, the covenant-giving creator of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, so picture that sort of sets some point during the day. Could have even been, I think, probably the next day that that took place. I think that was sort of, she comes back, the, you know, and... and I'm not, we're not exactly sure because, you know, I, I don't know how they kind of wove this because it seemed like she'd already been working and they say she's not even taking any really breaks. But, but at some point in this, whether it was the same day or the next day, they're going to get to sit down and eat. And this possibly even could have been like the dinner meal now. She's worked all day. And, and so now Boaz says to her at mealtime, come here and eat of bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed parched grain, which means baked grain, bread, to her. And she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. Now, who was she keeping that back for? Her mother-in-law, Naomi, right? You know, And, you know, she might have even, you know, if, if you've ever seen an orphan child at a big dinner meal, sometimes they'll stuff their pockets with food because they don't know if they're going to get any or maybe they're taking some back. You can almost picture like Ruth, you, the generosity is there, but when, when your brain is telling you this just doesn't, this is so overwhelming of generosity, it's like, you know, maybe she didn't even, maybe she kind of tried to sneak it, but she, she knew she needed to get some back to her mother-in-law. I could almost see Boaz probably smiling on the inside if, if, if it wasn't a public display, it's sort of private where she was doing that, knowing what that was happening. So then in verse 15, when she then arose to glean some more, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not rebuke her. And also let some of the grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. So just by way of measurement for us to context, that would be about supply-wise for her and, and a, f- a small family. That's about two weeks' worth of food. So normally, she'd be out there working for getting for daily, a daily meal, you know, or for a day's worth of provision. This, this was two weeks' worth of provision. Uh, what it would have basically boiled down to. So, so that's tremendous generosity. So you, now you'll understand when Naomi sees this, why Naomi responds the way she does. So um, verse 18. So then she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had cleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she was satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked, and the man's name with whom she had worked today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, or blessed he of Yahweh, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, the man is a relative of ours, one of our near kinsmen. So Naomi already knows the possibility now exists of redemption for her family. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women and that people do not meet you in any other field. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest 
and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. So the last verse actually probably takes and expands over maybe about a six-week time frame between barley and wheat harvest. So, you know, the writer gives the story. He gives us the intrigue. The beginning of chapter 2, he introduces Boaz as this, as this near kinsman. And then the, the story as it unpacks. And again, you, you, if you're reading this for the first time in a somatic nation, you're captured by the, the beauty of a love story that's unfolding and a redemption that's taking place. Something that is supernatural. I mean, it is the best with regards to romance and redemption and restoration. When we look at the gospel and the implications of the gospel, in fact, there are four, there are four major words that are used in the New Testament to unpack our salvation. Those words are justification, which is a legal term. It's a courtroom scene. By law, we're justified. Um, second is reconciliation. That's a family theme. We are reconciled together. Um, third is propitiation. That's a temple scene. That is one who bears wrath. And the fourth is redemption. That's a workplace scene, something that was not of use that's now being able to be used again. And so in, in seeing the story of Ruth, you see reconciliation and redemption as themes throughout that, that become not allegories, but illustrations of the power of the gospel as we see through Christ. So with that in mind, I want to I break this out in, in, in three major thoughts that we see with our ongoing characters, Boaz, Ruth, and Naomi. So thought number one is the generosity of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. And again, by way of parallel, think of our redeemer, Christ, and see you can see again sort of the allegory then in this. The second thing is the industrialness of Ruth, this, this hardworking young lady, her industrialness. And then the third thing is, the goodness of grace revealed, and we'll see that in, in Naomi. So with regards to the generosity of Boaz, in verse number 8, uh, Boaz says to her, Don't glean from another field, nor leave from here. Here is the blessing of guidance that, that Boaz was giving to Ruth, the kind of guidance to say, You don't need to leave. Yes, sir. <laughs> that, that's exactly what I was saying. Yes. Boy, that's right. That's right. You go to his field, nobody else's field. Right, right. I think the, cool, the amazing thing that we, we see, and this is coming to the last point with regards to, to Naomi. Naomi is, was of no real help to Ruth when they first got. She was so angry and so bitter, you know, um, uh, that she didn't really help her. It was Ruth who took the initiative to get, you know. And listen, there again would have been Levitical law that would have said to, the, to, to Naomi's situation that food should be brought in. But Ruth, instead of taking basically the, the handout or the gift, said, I need to go out and find provision. And I think at that, she's trusting in the providential hand of God. She's expressing a faith in a God that she has come to believe and trust in, that his providence is what has drawn them to this, back to this place. And, there's where, and I think then she saw that when she, she's just looking around at what field she can work in. And I think graciously God leads her to that place and clearly uh, there is something about her that captures Boaz, you know, I, and, um, and, and then when he finds out who it is, you can tell when he interacts with her, he says, his, like, he didn't know that's who already had touched his heart by the generosity that had been shown to Naomi. So when she comes back, she's bitter. But we know, again, from the, the translation of verse 1, that he was a friend to their family. So she, he knows that, that, the, that Ruth, the Moabite, has showed this lady who's a friend kindness by leaving family to come to be there. So he knows that, but he doesn't know who she is. He's not met her yet. He just sees a beautiful 
young woman working the field, and it's like, hey, who is that? And they say, oh, that's Ruth, the Moabite, you know. And then it's like, oh, that's a woman of integrity. She didn't just capture my eye. Man, her heart, the integrity she has. And so that's when he, you know, says, hey, I, the, the, what you've done for my friend Naomi, I haven't even met you, but you, you, you're already up here. I think the, the beautiful thing, you see God's providential hand moving. And, and, you know, we need to rest in that. Because we are, we are often caught in our circumstance of only what we can see right in front of us and miss sometimes the fact that God is going to work purposes much bigger beyond us because really He's not bound by time nor space, right? So He sees down on everything. We are, we are bound by time and space. All the laws of gravity and it apply to us. It doesn't apply to God. He's created them. And he's over them. So when he's looking down on us, his, his, he's looking where everything past is active and everything future is active. His, it's all in his sight. And he is in every moment of all time, at all time. Now, again, that should blow us away with how great our God is. To be able to say, if that is you in my moment right here where I cannot see, not by sight because that's limited on the horizon of what I have. In this moment, at 5.30 in the afternoon on Sunday, the 25th of September, 2022, this is as far as I can see. But that's not God. He's not bound by that. And He orchestrates and brings things for His purposes. And, uh, and I think that's the, that's the encouragement. So in that moment, when, when, when you know, for, for Ruth, again, again, this is just, Boaz is not, Jesus, but he is, he is a type of, in this story, of redemption, the kinsman redeemer. But you see his guidance to her, which is a blessing. You don't, you don't need to run about trying to find. In fact, then, then Naomi confirms that. Don't. Don't be seen. Even if you see. I, I mean, and by the way, is, is Naomi learning something? We didn't have anything in Bethlehem, so we ran to Moab because the famine wasn't going on there. There was grain in, in, in Moab. I'm telling you, Ruth, look here. If you see another field and it looks like you could be, do better that day, don't, 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 don't. Been there, done that, wasn't good. You stay right with our kinsmen. And um, because, because Naomi knew, you, you don't bring home two weeks worth of food being a gleaner. That was grace. Yes, was she diligent to go out and work? Her industrialist was outstanding. But God multiplied her wages because of his graciousness. Uh, I, I remember, forgive me, sidetrack illustration, but I remember when I was pastoring up in Stafford, and we were, uh, we were the church... It was only 25 years old, which was a pretty young church um, by way of, of uh, churches going. And it started as a plant from a church called Ramoth. Uh, uh, no, what? not what in Ramoth. Uh, well, I can see it and I can't call its name. Anyway, it's been started by a church down more in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And, um, and it, was, it was basically about eight people who were living more in, in near the courthouse of Stafford, Virginia, and uh, they said, we need to plant a church here. And so that, that team became sort of the core. And uh, they had helped about 10, 12 years later. They had launched a church in another area uh, of North Stafford called Widewater. And they had sent out a team. And uh, now we're about 15 years later. And we were launching out a church. And we had helped with one about a year and a half earlier, kind of a partnership with three other churches. But this is now one where we're sending out our minister of music with a team of people. And sort of as it got going, um, we, we, had, we were about 12 miles north in the town of Dumfries, Virginia. And then we had a guy who had come up to help living in Quantico, Virginia. And he met two women, two, two senior adult women who... Um, uh, he, my, our, our, our guy, Nathan, was trying to witness to a police officer, and the police officer said of, of the town of Quanka, I don't want anything to do with what you're talking about, but there's these two women you ought to know because they're talking the same language. And he told them 
where these two women were. And so Nathan went and knocked on the one of them's door and, and said, hey, this is how I, you know. And, and so he told them their story, how he got there. And they said, we have been prayer walking once a week, every week for the last three years, praying that God would send us someone to plant a church in Quantico. And so that start that so so what happened was though for us the the mother church we now had like we were trying to birth this church like we all of a sudden we discovered we had twins and so you all of a sudden think well this can be more expensive and that's that was you know so by faith you're looking but the finance committee is often looking by sight right you know there is an aspect well what's this going to cost right and I can remember as we were talking it through it's like. I didn't know how we could do this and what that was going to look like. And, and uh, I remember by faith that group took a leap of faith and said, okay, we're going to, we, just don't, we don't know how we're going to afford this, but we're going to step out and this is what we're going to do. And, uh, and so the budget was built off this number that, that was exceedingly above what they had ever really put out there. Now, I, I don't, I'm assuming like most churches, we have a budget, but most of the time we don't ever spend our complete budget. I don't know if that's the case here, but at least in the 20 years, I'd always been, we'd have a budget. But most of the time we didn't ever spend all of that. And so that was the case. So most of the time, I, in fact, I went back, like I, could, I found like 20 years of, because uh, I wanted to do this as a celebration because we get to the end of the year and something amazing had happened. And uh, so I went and I found as many budgets from previous years. And every one of them, you know, not every year had we m- taken in as much as it's been out. But, there, but most years you had taken in more than you'd spent out. But we had never had a year that we actually took in more than was on paper as the budget. That year, I, w- I walked into it and I said, do you guys remember the stress of a year ago when we were thinking, how in the world... Because, I, listen, I was stressing with them. I was trying to be the optimistic one, but I'm stressing over it. And I'll never forget, I said, not only did we take in more than we spent, for the first time in the history of the church, we took in more than we budgeted for. Not only that, we took in 25% more than we had budgeted for. And they were like, how many more churches can we start? You know, it's just, it becomes an encouragement, right? That she had gone out and gleaned for a day, and God had given two weeks. Uh, it's just an amazing thing. You've all seen it in your lives personally, times that you didn't have and you did, and you saw God's faithfulness bring him back even more. So the blessed, blessing of God, it's second verse number 9 uh, have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? There's the blessing of protection. Verse number 13. Um, then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoke very kindly to me, though I am not. You've treated me like one of your maidservants, though I am not. There's the blessing of encouragement. She knew that even though she wasn't a part of his immediate clan, He had treated there as though she was. Verse 14, Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here, eat of the bread. Again, that would have been very unusual. Dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and passed, and he passed the the baked bread basically to her. And she ate and was satisfied. The blessing of satisfaction. She had been welcomed in to his inner circle of kindness. And in that, she found deep satisfaction. Let me just stop there to say, the world does all it can to put, how shall we say, sweets in front of us. But sweets can taste good in the mouth, but God offers the menu of the feast of the fillets and the vegetables and the you know what I'm saying? We 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 see the cesspool pond and think that's the only water supply when God says, I have a living water in this rock. You know, God has so much more to satisfy us, but we see that momentary thing that we think is good or is going to meet our need. 
And God says, I've got something so much better if, if you will trust me in that. And she finds in this the blessing of satisfaction. Also in verse 14, when he draws her into his inner circle there, the blessing of fellowship. Um, one of, the, one of the, the, the more precious things that we get to experience is the fact that we get to live life together as family. And that's the beauty of the body. Um, and, and I would say this, any healthy church needs to recognize we not always would agree with one another. I mean, you've been married long enough to know we argued because we, we had a different view of what we thought was the best for the other and for us corporately. That, you know, if there's no argue, now, if it's all arguing, then that's a different story. But if there's no arguing, it makes me ask, how much do we value the relationship, right? Because we want good. We, we want that. By the way, just my, my lesson I teach for raising children, children should see healthy arguments of parents work through, work through things. Again, that's a healthy thing because they realize, oh, yeah, mommy, I can do this, and they love one another, and it's good, and, and, uh, and then, wow, they have a pretty big kiss afterwards, and that should kind of freak out the 8-year-old, right? You know, so, you know, um, they should see that they, that they can argue because they want good and that they can kiss and make up. And they, that, that's a healthy thing. And sometimes that, that's, you know, I see in family counseling sometimes that being absent, um, what needs to be. So there's the blessing of fellowship. Verse 15, when she rose to glean, Boaz commanded the young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Um, uh, I'm sorry, let me, let me state this in verse 14. Let me, I'll use 15 and 16 together. But back in verse 14, the blessing of acceptance is that he invites her into to where he's eating, and then he also commends the young men, let her glean even among the sheaves. In other words, she doesn't have to wait on the sheaves to be gleaned and then come pick up, but let her come in along with you. The, the blessing of acceptance, she's a part of our group now. And then the final thing is the blessing of provision, which is verse 15 and 16. Let her glean among the sheaves and let some of the grain from the bundles fall purposely for, it, for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. That God gives greater provision and blessing. So we see that through the generosity of Boaz, the blessing of guidance, protection, encouragement, satisfaction, fellowship, acceptance, and provision. And then the industriousness of Ruth is that in verse 17, so she gleaned in the, in the field until evening and beat out what she'd gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Here's what she did. She made full use of the moment. Um, listen, she just didn't fill up her pockets and say, I got enough for today or tomorrow, she worked all day long to get all she could. Generosity was being shown, and she wanted to fill up on it. Um, when God's just giving us his goodness, don't feel like you need to shut it off. I think there's times we feel guilty for his goodness. And, and we, we need not. We need to thank him for his goodness to us and generosity. And so she made full use of the moment. She stayed all day to work, to be diligent, of use of time, to enjoy all that was being provided. Second, she made best use of what she had. She threshed the wheat on the field because she didn't have anything in the threshing area. She, in verse 18, she took it up, went into the city of her mother-in-law and gleaned it and brought back and gave what she had kept back. And then we see that she was told to go back and continue. And we see that she did. She didn't rest on yesterday's victory. She had two weeks worth of food. She didn't then just say, I'm not going the next day. She went back to glean again day after day, trusting in God's good provision, but enjoying the bounty of what he was given. For someone who's come out and thinking of such destitute, you can get in the mindset that just enough is all I need and, and, and miss out on the, the, the blessing of, of, of greater goodness. And she didn't want to. Now, I'm not health and wealth here. That's not what I'm speaking about. 
I'm talking about the goodness of God's grace and the mercy for which he provides and wanting to fully enjoy. God, I trust, I want all of you. And I'm not going to rest on yesterday. If yesterday's time with you was wonderful, I'm not going to rest on that. I want to enjoy that today and tomorrow and the next day. I want all that you have for me each day. I will say for me, I, str- I saw God's hand work so powerfully in Iceland. I thought, I can't get any better than that. I don't know that I could see anything greater than that. And so I came back to the States almost not expecting God to ever be able to work like that again. Therefore, why be as diligent to pray, to pursue, to trust? That's my arrogance being put on display. That's what it was. God, you can't top what you just did. Why not? You're saying I'm limited? It took a little time for me to, to recognize that wasn't me being humble. That was me being arrogant. The God, I had to be overseas to see you do something that great? I guess, I guess you only work in great ways outside of this country. Right? That, 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 wasn't my humili- that wasn't humility. That was arrogance. Something I have had to confess and ask forgiveness for. And so she wanted all that God could give in every moment. Then lastly is the goodness of grace revealed. We see Naomi's response. So verse 19, where did you glean today and where did you work? Blessed is the one who took notice of you. She told her mother-in-law, and the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And then Naomi said to her mother-in-law, and this is is powerful because of where Naomi has been. I mean, don't, don't miss what Naomi had been saying, how she had been feeling. And for the first time, blessed be he of the Lord. That, trans, that translates difficult in English, but the, the idea or the concept of what she is saying is that Yahweh's provision through Boaz, who she knows as a kinsman redeemer, that, that blessed is sheer, which is that word from Psalm 1, is sheer, that this fullness of satisfaction can be realized. So here from the woman who was so bitter and angry, who have not after... How, if you had been gone for over 10 years and you were returning back to friends and distant family members and they are welcoming you and celebrating you and you immediately say, stop making a big to-do. Do not celebrate with me. I'm bitter and angry. Oh, not what we were expecting. She just puts herself away. Now all of a sudden in this moment, blessed is sheer, the type of happiness and satisfaction that is in the fullness of what one could ever experience. Psalm 1, kind of life, is what her testimony is is describing this type of blessedness that comes from Yahweh in that he has not forsaken his kindness to the living and to the dead. In other words, this generosity will come for me to redeem what my husband had and redeem what you have lost in the passing of your husband, my son. She knew that this redemption provided fullness of things of inheritance and rights back. She already understood that. That's a massive mind change, is it not? That her mindset's completely different. How does that happen? I believe it's the goodness of grace being revealed. That God takes 
and he opens our eyes to see clearer. That's why, by the way, when Paul says faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word, before we were believers, there was the absence of faith in our life. And then God supernaturally, through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the hearing of the word, opens our eyes by faith to see the good news, to see the gospel, that the cross, that instrument of death, right? That, that the, the cross, our hope. Have you, have you ever thought about it? That is the most painful tool of execution ever invented by humanity. If you saw someone wearing a necklace with an electric chair around it, you would think they needed to be evaluated for, for psychi psychiatric reasons, right? Because that's an instrument of death. Who would celebrate that? And yet the Christian church has, that's been our symbol. It's not been an empty tomb. It's, it's not been a temple. It's not been a, a, a dove. The most prolific instrument testimony that we have is the cross. The cruelest form of death ever devised by humanity. God opens the eyes to see out of death we might have life. The death of God's Son Himself bearing the penalty of our sin. And in that, as we walk by faith through His Word, and His Word illuminates, even when we get into the funk, even when we crawl into the cave, even when life has rocked us and we have gone through hurt, that God Himself then seems to illuminate our mind with gospel truth in the very depths and midst of our pain and agony and discord and heartaches and hardships. And in that, grace becomes evident and relevant and active again. It wasn't that it was absent to her, but it was absent through her. And he worked graciously through his daughter-in-law to reignite the heart of seeing her true father's mercy and grace revealed. And Naomi turned in this chapter. In fact, for all that this chapter introduces, perhaps the reason the author intended us to see this transition was to remind us of the goodness of what it is to move from misery and loathing to joyous expectancy. And I hope for all of us that we can live in that moment, in that life. To say, God, I, I, ex I, I joyously expect what you have for me. My bones hurt a little bit more today than they did 30 years ago. Mine do, anyway. I'm 55. My eyes don't see nearly as well. Just can't run nearly as fast. The arthritis, my hands don't work nearly as good. But I have more expectancy for God's goodness because I have seen for 35 plus years the work of grace and His goodness. And so I pray that we can, we can pass that on. Pass that on to the younger ones. Pass that on to the new believers. Even, even, even the little eight, how old is your granddaughter? Eight, nine, six? Six. I'm sorry. Back to your husband. I'm sorry, Shirley. Six. <laughs> Such a true statement. Amen. Amen and oh me. Um, at six, pass on where she sees and grows with expectation to see God's good hand. I believe that that 18-year-old girl, when she penned those words in that Bible, had some prompting from the Holy Spirit to write that. Probably didn't know, didn't think, but a prompting of such that she would 
put something like that in there. And pass on an expectation to her father that I'm believing my God to work, even if it meant my death, to give you the greatest gift I know, and that is the grace of my Lord and Savior, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Well, I tell you, we could all learn a lot from that 18-year-old young lady. Any questions or thoughts with regards to Luke, I mean to Ruth chapter 2 that jumped, has jumped out at you? Maybe we, we, I missed for sure. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Mm. Well, can we sing that song? Maybe that'd be our prayer of. That's hymn number, and I am turning off my mic before we sing. <laughs> hymn number 76. Number 76, and we're just singing the first two, so we're, on, we're going to do all five of them. No, 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 it, it doesn't stretch from what you see. We're only doing just a little bit, so. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinners is, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of cancelled sin, He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean, His blood availed for me. Hear Him, ye deaf, His praise ye dumb, Ye loosen tongues and ploy. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come, And ye prelane for joy. My gracious Master and my God, Assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name.